sunshine. <laughs> I have a feeling the sunshine went out today. Thank you to all our virtual watchers as well. And um, we're going to begin by singing our prayer of the child of love. So I'd like for you to stand and it's on the front of your book.
we bring our full awareness to the one loving divine presence. The presence that flows through us as us into this world. We are one unified completely with love. And we affirm that the spirit within knows the answer to any thing that we see as a problem. We know we can turn from the problem to the spirit within and accept spirit's guidance. Spirit's resolution. As we turn away from any thought of confusion to a consciousness of peace. We know that the answer to every question is within us right now. Because the divine is within us right now. So in calm confidence and perfect trust, we let go of the problem as a problem and receive the answers as responses to our questions. Always answered. We are so grateful to know that this is the truth, to know that we have this available to us at all times. And our task is to remember. Remember to include spirit in our lives in all ways. And together we say, so it's so it is. is. Now we'd like to introduce our special music for today, the Dangling Participles. Please give them all a moment. So we learned that the message today is titled The Color of Life and Feelings. So we wanted to share with you a brand new song. Um, just wrote this one. It's called Color Past the Edges. Thank you. 
Well, no, but I keep getting yeah. off calls off because I've yeah. them. <laughs> I am very happy to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Reverend Julie Cribley. And I'm going to let her introduce the, the title of her talk and, and go on to show you how perfectly it um, is a message for today, and I'd like for you to all give her a warm welcome as well. Gorgeous. Truly was a really nice, and I thought Fellowship just has the best music. I mean, a lot of other things are really cool about Fellowship, but music always is high on my list. So welcome to my talk today, The Colors of Life and Feelings. Now, I began this contemplation thinking of colors in art and poetry, and I really did not have any idea that this is what my talk today was going to be, because often as I speak here, when I leave on the way home, I'm so filled with cool feelings that things come to me and I think, oh, next time I speak, that's what I should speak on. And then all of a sudden, this color idea popped up because I found this poet and I fell in love with her words about color. So here we are. And so after I read it, I thought, oh, I've really grown to love this talk and I hope you do too. <laughs> so now to me, an artist is someone who feels and expresses their feelings through art, words, and colors. I think that might sound easy, but I personally don't think it is. A lot of people think or believe, and they think they know how they feel. But that's thinking, or believing, or knowing. It's not feeling. And art is feeling, not knowing, or believing, or thinking. Now, almost anyone can learn to think, or to believe, or to know. But not a single human being can be taught how to feel. Why? Well, because whenever you think of what you believe or know, you're a lot of other people. But the moment you feel, you're nobody but yourself. To be nobody but yourself in a world which is truly doing its best, night and day, to make you somebody else, or like everybody else, means to fight one of the many battles that are, as human beings we fight. Nor should we ever stop fighting being ourselves. Yet, how do we teach people how to feel? I compare this to trying to teach faith. We must all find God in whatever form we need God to be. You can't teach someone how to have faith. You have to develop your own faith, just as you experience your own feelings. So I began thinking of what I would name my God and what colors do I think my God is? So I began to think if I gave my God my own name and it's her own color, that we could even deepen our relationship. So as I was writing this talk, I thought to myself, well, today, I think my God's name is Penelope. And I think she's green. She's just bathed in the most beautiful green light, which of course, if you ask me, most times I would tell you is my favorite color. Because of course, in the spring, how can we not celebrate Green. Oh, we've waited all year, all winter for it, right? So, but then again, tomorrow, my God very well might be Tim, and he might be purple. Since change is always ever part of life, why not change our relationship with God every day? So, that led me to think about colors of life and feelings. Now, nearly two centuries ago, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, a German writer, artist, and natural scientist, contemplated the psychology of color and emotions. And then I discovered through thinking about this, another poet, this is an American poet, her name is Mary, I'm gonna spell her last name because I have no clue how to say it, R-U-E-F-L-E. -E. She cracked open this eggshell of our fragility to review within it a total kaleidoscope of aliveness. What emerged is the feeling, something that beyond the reasoned understanding, 
that sadness is not the tip of the iceberg of our hardwired, hardwired grief for this life, but the blazing fire of life itself, of our love for life, burning with the fact that there is no disappointment without hope, no heartbreak without love, and that for in the shadows, the sadness cast on the walls of our being is really the delicious delirium of our life dream itself. For let's face it, sometimes the heart must break for it to beat again. She expressed and named colors to different feelings, using our sadness as a place to begin. So I needed to quote her because I found her prose so beautiful. Blue sadness is the sweetness cut into strips with scissors and then into little pieces by a knife. It is the sadness of reverie and nostalgia. It may be, for example, the memory of a happiness that is now only a memory. It has receded into a niche that cannot be dusted for it beyond our reach, distinct and dusty. Blue sadness itself lies in your inability to dust it. It is as unreachable as the sky. It is a fact reflecting the sadness of all facts. Blue sadness is that which you wish to forget, such an odd, unshareable thought that makes one blush, a deep rose spreading over the blue fact of sadness, creating a situation that now has become rose not blue. And while I certainly have created a lot of my own thoughts and words with this talk, I just really didn't know where to stop with her prose about color. So I'd love to share some more. Purple sadness is the sadness of classical music and eggplant. The stroke of midnight, words with too many meanings, incense, insomnia, and the crescent moon. It is possible to dance to purple sadness, though slowly, as slowly as it would take to dig a pit to hold a sleeping giant. Purple sadness is pervasive and goes deeper into the interior than the world's greatest nickel deposits or any other sadness on earth. It is the sadness of heels echoing down a long corridor. It is the sound of your mother closing the door at night, leaving you alone. Gray sadness is the sadness of paper clips and rubber bands, of rain and squirrels. Gray sadness is the most common of all sadnesses. Gray sadness is beautiful, but not to be confused with the beauty of blue sadness, which cannot be replaced. Sad to say, gray sadness is replaceable. It can be replaced daily. It is the sadness of a melting snowman in a snowstorm. Red sadness is a secret one. Red sadness never appears sad. It actually appears in flashes of passion and anger, fear, inspiration, and courage. In the dark, unsellable visions, it is an upside down penny concealed beneath a tea cozy. And even the most even tempered and steady minded people are not exempt from it. Green sadness is the sadness dressed for graduation. It is the sadness of June, the table laid before a party, the smell of new strawberries about to be devoured. It is the sadness of unperceived and therefore never felt and said seldom expressed, except on occasion by little girls who, in, intimidation, in imitation of their grandmothers, decide who shall have their bunny when they die. Green sadness weighs no more than an unused handkerchief. It is the funeral silence of bones beneath the green carpet of evenly cut grass upon which the bride and groom walk in joy. Brown sadness is the simplest sadness. It is the sadness of huge upright stones. That is all. It is simple. Huge upright stones surround the other sadnesses and protect them. A circle of huge upright stones. Who would have thought it? Orange sadness is the sadness of anxiety and worry. It is the sadness of an orange balloon drifting over snow-capped mountains. The sadness of counting as even when one worries that another shipment of thoughts is about to enter the house. 
It speaks the strange antlered language of phantoms and dead batteries. It is the sadness of all things left overnight in the oven and forgotten. In the morning, and as such, orange sadness has become lost among us altogether, like its motive. Yellow sadness is the surprised sadness. It is the sadness of naps and eggs, swans down, sachet powder, and the moist towelettes. It is the citrus of sadness in all things round and whole and dying like the sun. Possess this sadness, which is the sadness of the first place. It is sadness of explosion and expansion. It is a superior joy and a superior sadness, that of revolving doors and turnstiles. It is the confusing sadness of the never ending and the evervescent. The sadness of a poet pointing to a flower and saying, what is that when what that is is violet? It is the sadness of that. So as I finished that reading, she then offers up that we should substitute the word, the word happiness in every place we just had sadness. And she asked the question of what would change. So I thought, let's try it with just a color, just to see. Purple happiness is the happiness of classical music and eggplant. The stroke of midnight, words with too many meanings, incense, insomnia, and the crescent moon. It is possible to dance to purple happiness, though slowly, as slowly as it takes to dig a pit to hold a sleeping giant. Purple happiness is pervasive and goes deeper into the interior than the world's greatest nickel deposits or any other happiness on, the, on earth. It is the happiness of heels echoing down a long corridor. It is the sound of your mother closing the door at night, leaving you alone after kissing you goodnight and wishing you sweet dreams. Well, I think that's true. Happiness changed that whole feeling, didn't it? And yet happiness and sadness exist together, as do everything we experience in this life. So, you know, colors majorly impact our emotions from encouraging happiness to even inspiring creativity. Clothing can alter our mood in all kinds of ways. We might not even have realized it, but you know how sometimes you put on just that certain outfit and you feel just beautiful because the color woke that up in you? Colors, of course, can generate all kinds of feelings, happy, sad, calm, agitated, even hungry. And these feelings can change based on a colored shade, brightness, tint, or tone. And because colors have so much power, it is essential we truly should understand the psychology, the effects that color have on us. Colors not only help in depicting our emotions and moods, but also help represent our traditions and cultures. For example, in Western countries, white is considered an auspicious color that represents purity and innocence. But yet, in the eastern countries, the same color depicts mourning and loss. To understand the many shades of color, I think it would help us on our path to self-discovery. The way colors show up around us in our auras or in our chakra centers that allow us to see how we're doing, how balanced are we. Here's something I found really fun to think about. When we buy things, our color preferences might say something about us something about the image we wish to project. So, of course, factors such as our age and gender also influence our color choices. And they did a study on the color of car we buy. And so I thought I'd just share with you what I learned about this because I found it pretty interesting. White cars represent the feelings of fresh and clean. The color is often used to evoke a sense of youth and newness. Black cars are described as powerful, which might be the reason why black is the most popular color for luxury vehicles. People often describe color as sexy, powerful, and mysterious. Now, most of my cars have been black, so I'm not sure what that says. Whereas silver is the third most popular vehicle color and is linked to a sense of innovation. High-tech products are often silver, so the color is seen as new and modern, the cutting edge. And then there's red. Red is a bold, attention-getting color. So preferring this type of car might mean you want to project an image of power and action and confidence. 
Now, personally, I've always believed the only car that should be red is a Ferrari. But I have to say, if someone gave me a yellow Ferrari, I would probably take it because that's the only way I will ever have a Ferrari if someone actually gives it to me. Blue is often described as the color of stability and safety. Now, driving a blue car or an SUV might indicate that you consider yourself dependable and trustworthy. And according to the experts, now you know whoever they are, Driving a yellow vehicle might mean you're a happy person in general and perhaps a bit more willing than the average person to take a risk. And of course, the experts suggest that people who drive gray cars don't want to stand out. So, I wonder why is color such a powerful force in our lives? What effect can it have on our bodies and minds? And while perceptions of color are somewhat subjective, some color effects have universal meanings. So now what I love is I hope when you go out and you look at your car, you think, hmm, did I choose this color and why? So colors in the red area of the color spectrum are known, are known as the warm colors include red, orange, and yellow. Those warm colors evoke emotions ranging from the feelings of warmth and comfort to feelings of anger and hostility. Colors on the blue side of the spectrum are known as cool colors and indicate blue, purple, and greens. These colors are often described as calm, but can also call to mind feelings of sadness or indifference. Now, there was a study done in 2020 that surveyed 4,500 people across the globe and found that people commonly associate certain colors with certain emotions. So 51% of the respondents associated black with sadness. 43% of the people associated white with relief. 68, red with love, 35, blue to feelings of relief as well, 39, linked green to contentment, 52% felt that yellow means joy, 25% reported they found purple associated with pleasure, 36, linked brown to disgust, 44, associated the color orange with joy, 50% linked pink with love. The study's researchers suggested that such results indicated that color and emotion associations appear to have some universal qualities. Though shared meanings may play an essential role in the aiding of communication and understanding of one another. So here's a fun fact. Many people are capable of seeing one million colors, thanks to the light sensitive cones that we have in our eyes meaning the reaction you have to a pastel lavender tone could be quite different from the feelings evoked by a deep eggplant purple. Imagine if you can for a minute, one million colors. Wow, we really are amazing creatures, aren't we? Theoretically, red is one of the most visible colors and in the entire color spectrum because of its long wavelength. I noticed that Mary, our above-mentioned poet, did not touch on the color black. Without black, no color has any depth. Black, known as the absence of color, is probably the strongest of all our colors and can be used to imitate very extreme emotions throughout the spectrum of our emotions. Black is a color of mystery, boldness, and confidence. And with most colors, because emotions are so subjective, there are positive and negative associations with this color, as with all colors, really. And with every experience to be had and every emotion to be felt. So, according to Bert Hellinger, the so-called black sheep of the family are, in fact, seekers of liberation roads for the family tree those members of the tree who do not adapt to the rules or traditions of the family system, those who are constantly seeking to change beliefs, going in contrast to roads marked by family traditions, those criticized, tried, and even rejected, those in general, have been called to release the tree of repetitive stories that frustrate entire generations. The black sheep, those who do not adapt, those who scream, rebel, repair, detoxify, and create a new and blooming branch. Countless unfulfilled desires, unfulfilled dreams. 
Frustrated talents of our ancestors manifest themselves in their rebellion, looking to take their place. The family tree, by inertia, will want to continue to maintain the castrating and toxic effects of its trunk, which makes its task difficult and conflicting, that no one makes you doubt. Take care of your rarity as the most precious flower of your tree, for you are the dreams of your ancestors. You have no idea how much I love this reading. I was always considered the black sheep of my family, and all of a sudden I found purpose in being the black sheep. And while the changes that I strove to make to break from what was toxic in my environment may have not always been the best choice, they were a different choice. And I feel like that's what he's encouraging us to do, is to celebrate different choices from toxic patterns and behaviors and to celebrate black sheep. So, you know, if anybody thinks differently or acts differently to us and has their own unique traits and creative visions, we should truly embrace them and not shame them. For we cannot shame ourselves or anyone else into change. We can only love ourselves and them into true evolution. Love is so much more than the color red. Love is all around you, and I hope you learn to open your eyes to that. Love can be found in every aspect of our lives. It can be found tucked in the early morning sunrises and the smell of your favorite places. It can be found in the laughter shared, and it bounces off of you when you hug the people you care for. Feel it swell within your ribcage when you hear your favorite song or discover something that moves you. I hope you fall in love with growth and change, the messiness and the beauty of making mistakes and becoming exactly who you were born to be. I hope you find love in places that were once devoid of it, in places within yourself that you could have been kinder to, softer to in the past. Because there's one thing I have learned, love is so much more than a human being holding your hand or your heart. Love is everything and can be found in all the colors of the world. I hope when you leave today, you start noticing colors everywhere, the colors in your life. Of course, spring is a beautiful time to be reminded to stop and appreciate color. The beautiful flowers that come in the spring in Michigan, I just don't think can be compared to anything else in the world. Such a beautiful place to be, Michigan in the spring. And when I asked myself this question, why did people follow Jesus? And what came to me as the answer was, because he loved them. We can and should always choose love to follow. So if you find yourself feeling like you're walking through the darkness, fill your thoughts full of colors the colors that represent light and joy to you. And if your life feels like it has become only black and white, just make sure that your dreams and your thoughts explode into glorious colors. I loved it that the dangling particles found that line in that song about dreams and color. Marcus Aurelius once said, the color once said, the soul becomes dyed with the colors of our thoughts. Always good to be reminded, right, that the color of our thoughts is becoming who we are. So my husband one, once wrote me this poem called Soul Colors, and I thought, oh, it fits in this talk. And as I'm celebrating poets today, she was born to chase the weather and to ask the storm to wear a smile, made from a grin of rainbows and pulling color from the sky, she painted her world in lilacs and mums, violets and tulips, and wild roses too, saving enough of every shade and enough of every hue to bribe the sun into shining all the time, leaving the lumens of color and light to warm the loving canvas of her soul. That's what I want you to walk away with today, remembering that colors can warm 
your very soul and bring you back to that place of peace, trusting in who you are and what you came to do. So Stephen, thank you for helping me see the different hues and tones that black sheep come in and helping me believe that sometimes the black sheep actually grows into the shepherd. May we all remember that black can be truly a beautiful color in this world, as can all the colors of this world. Bless you one and all for you allowing me to grow into a shepherd at times. Still proud of my black sheep family history. I didn't know until this talk and allowing me to share my talk with you today. The many colors of life and feelings. Bless you all. Oh, thank you, Julie. Absolute delight, as always. Uh, let's sing together our thoughts and prayers. I think it's pretty good.
the answers to their questions, listening to love and accepting those answers, envisioning them healthy and whole.
artists and musicians and others, and then you have to do a little bit of everything. And, uh, when we get to the chorus, I'd like you to join us. There's a part that says, she will rise. So you'll, you'll hear it come in. I'll keep it.
service, and Julie, it's so right we have, and we are so fortunate to have the music that we do at the fellowship. Corey, thank you, and the dangling participles, thank you so much.